Hi there, it's Miss Renee the OT. I'm doing something a little different today to talk to you about Lyme disease. And what a perfect time to talk about it since May is Lyme Disease Awareness Month. As a person who has personally experienced an impact in my quality of life due to Lyme disease, I feel it in my heart to spread awareness about this disease and how we as occupational therapists can better serve our clients with Lyme disease. So what is Lyme disease? Lyme disease is a bacterial infection caused by a spirochete or corkscrew shaped bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi. Yuck. It's a result from being bitten by an infected tick. Ugh. The CDC estimates 476,000 cases of Lyme disease a year. However, it's thought that this number is not a clear representation due to limitations, such as misclassifications and underreporting, decreased funding to collect data state by state, exposure versus residence inconsistencies, and changes with the definition of Lyme disease. Symptoms are sometimes differentiated between acute symptoms and residual or chronic symptoms. Here's a chart with a general overview of different symptoms. As if Lyme disease wasn't enough, some patients also experience co-infections as ticks can carry multiple pathogens that can also be transmitted. Lyme disease is also sometimes known as the great imitator as it can mimic symptoms of other conditions such as arthritis, fibromyalgia, myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome, and multiple sclerosis. Diagnostics. The CDC currently recommends a two-tiered approach to diagnose Lyme disease. It's important to note that some have concerns of the insensitivity of these tests, as sometimes the tests can cause false positives or false negatives. There have also been concerns with the reliability of the testing, as it can take a few weeks for a person to produce a measurable level of antibodies to show up in the testing. This really leaves a small window for proper diagnosis and treatment. Treatment. Currently, the only recognized treatment in conventional medicine is a few weeks course of antibiotics. However, approximately 10 to 20% of patients have reported persistent or intermittent symptoms following antibiotic treatment. Unfortunately, sometimes seeking alternative medicine and approaches can be a huge financial burden, as most of the time these approaches are not covered by insurance, which forces these patients to pay out of pocket. Prevention. Try your best to avoid areas where ticks live, such as leaves, grass, brush, and logs. Try to stay on cleared trails and paths rather than walking through brush. Wear defensive clothing, such as long pants and sleeves and light colors so ticks can be spotted easily. Buy clothing that has been pre-treated with tick repellent or you can purchase tick repellent that can be sprayed on clothing, which stays even after a few washes or tick repellent to put on the skin directly. Make sure you keep your animals up to date on flea and tick guards. Check for ticks on your body. Shower right away after being potentially exposed. Place clothing in a hot dryer for at least 10 minutes. And remove ticks right away by using a fine pointed tweezer. Get as close as you can to the mouth to pull the body and the head out. Disinfect the bite area and save the tick to be tested. You can check with your doctor or you can check out testing areas such as the ones shown here. Inconsistencies. Side note, the following statements are used as hypothetical examples, but they are based off of possible misconceptions and inconsistencies about Lyme disease. You'll get the typical bullseye rash if you have Lyme disease. The scientific term for this rash is called erythema migrans. The data on this really varies as there is a 27% to 80% range of people who actually develop this rash when they have Lyme disease. Personally, I did not develop a bullseye rash when I was infected, which is probably part of the reason why it took me much longer to figure out what was causing my symptoms and what prevented me from getting immediate treatment. But I don't live in a woody area, so I can't get Lyme disease. Lyme disease has actually been documented in every state in the United States. Although risk maps show a cluster of Lyme disease cases in the northeastern area of the United States, some have pointed out that these maps may not accurately depict Lyme disease prevalence due to misdiagnosis, decreased testing and research, insensitivity of current lab tests, 
mismatched formal reporting of cases versus Lyme related insurance claims and inconsistencies of the state of residence where the patient was diagnosed with Lyme disease versus where the person was actually exposed. There are actually new studies which have found Borrelia infected ticks on the beaches of California. Lyme disease bacteria has been documented in penguins in Antarctica. Lyme disease trends have also been documented in Canada, Europe, and Asia. Lyme disease is completely curable. While some people report their symptoms resolving after antibiotic treatment, others report that they continue to experience symptoms long term even after antibiotic treatment. Sometimes these symptoms can be very debilitating and decrease a person's quality of life. I have actually also experienced this where I was put through antibiotic treatment for a few weeks and I actually experienced a worsening of symptoms after that antibiotic treatment. Testing negative for Lyme disease means you are cured. Again, this brings us back to the topic of patients who still experience symptoms even after antibiotic treatment. Some patients, after they've gone through the antibiotic treatment, they're retested and they test negative for Lyme disease, but they continue to experience symptoms. This actually also happened to me. I initially tested positive on the Western blot, and after I did the antibiotic treatment, I tested negative but I experienced a worsening of symptoms. Again, there are still some questions about the sensitivities of these tests. More research needs to be done to fully understand diagnosis, symptomology, and treatment of Lyme disease. Lyme disease is not life-threatening. Although Lyme-related deaths are currently thought to be rare, some state that the data on Lyme-related deaths could be misleading due to inaccuracies in the labeled cause of deaths. As mentioned before, we could speculate that this might be due to things such as misdiagnosis, unknown infection, or lack of testing. It has also been said that outcomes of the disease, persistence of symptoms, and deaths might not be tracked very well. It might be hard to track due to difficulty in operationalizing a definition for persistent symptoms. Lyme-related deaths have been reported due to Lyme carditis, tick-borne encephalitis, and unfortunately suicide. It's also important to note that there are other tick-borne illnesses that could possibly be fatal, such as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Powassan Virus, Tick-Borne Relapsing Fever, and Babesiosis. So, how do we as occupational therapists assist our clients with Lyme disease? We can do this by validating the patient's experiences, empathizing with their concerns, and respecting their autonomy. We can also gather an occupational profile of the patient to understand their interests, patterns of daily living, values, and needs. We can gather information about their medical history to fully understand their symptoms and how they affect their functional performance. It's also important to understand how certain treatments might affect our patients with Lyme disease. Some patients report experiencing something called a Herxheimer reaction, or Herxing for short, Reportedly, this is when a patient experiences a fever, flu, muscle or joint pain, cognitive impairment, and or worsening of symptoms during treatment due to the body reacting to the supposed die-off of the Lyme disease bacteria. We can help to incorporate energy conservation and work simplification techniques to encourage pre-planning and simplification of tasks to conserve energy as severe fatigue is one of the most common symptoms in patients with Lyme disease. It might also be helpful for the patient to keep a diary of their symptoms throughout the day so they can understand what time of the day they might be optimal so they can plan important tasks and activities around that time. Along with energy conservation and work simplification techniques, the OT can implement joint protection and pain management techniques as another common symptom of Lyme disease is joint pain and stiffness. The occupational therapist can educate the client on joint protection and pain management techniques when performing activities as to decrease the risk of pain and discomfort. Some patients with Lyme disease also experience mild to severe cognitive difficulties. This can be seen with decreased attention, decreased processing speed, decreased planning and organization, and also symptoms of depression and anxiety. Sometimes these cognitive difficulties are referred to as brain fog. Therefore, it might be appropriate for the therapist to incorporate cognitive therapy and psychosocial approaches. 
Patients with Lyme disease can also experience visual symptoms such as blurred vision, double vision, light sensitivity, visual fatigue, and floaters. For patients that are experiencing vision concerns, it might be appropriate to incorporate vision therapy approaches. In congruence with these approaches, the therapist can also address adaptations and modifications. I hope you now have a better understanding of Lyme disease and how we as occupational therapists can better serve our clients with Lyme disease. Take the Lyme disease challenge with me to help spread awareness about Lyme disease.